In the world of opera, the overture is the piece of music that is played before the actors ever set foot on the stage. And as an audience, we are given glimpses of the themes and the melodies that will come back later on in the show to be more fully developed and explored. But the overture briefly introduces them to us so that we can recognize them later on. In the first 14 verses of John's Gospel, they serve as a kind of overture for what John is going to do in his book. And they are a place where we are given short bursts of melody and themes that John will develop later on so that we can recognize them later when he returns to them. And the theme that I want us to focus on this evening that John sort of begins to lay out there is the theme in his book of belief. John's gospel is a great place to go when you need some help wrapping your head around this rather complex idea of believing in Jesus. Because John doesn't just tell us what it means to believe in Jesus. He shows us what it looks like to believe in Jesus. And for a lot of us, the idea of believing in something may seem pretty black and white. You either believe in something or you don't. But in reality, belief is actually, as we come to find out, a little bit more complicated than those two categories. Sometimes a lot more complicated. For example, what if I were to present this scenario to you? If I were to say that a few weeks ago I saw former President George W. Bush wearing only a towel. Okay, there's my scenario. Now right now you are deciding where you fall on that statement. Do you believe it or do you not? So let me explain it. Several weeks ago I was getting ready to come to church in the morning. I stepped out of the shower wearing only a towel and there was George W. Bush on the television. And so I saw George W. Bush wearing only a towel. Okay. Granted, a play on words, but helpful for us tonight. Because at first glance, the option to believe or not may have been pretty simple. Either this really happened, either this is a true statement, or it is not a true statement. But let's unpack it a little bit more, because this black and white area of belief sometimes can be a little bit more gray. For example, before I explain what really took place, some of you may have believed I was telling the truth, but if you were asked to try and explain how it could be true, you would say, I'm not really sure. But I'm going to give him benefit of the doubt. Greg's a pretty good guy. I'm going to give him benefit of the doubt, but I couldn't really tell you how his statement is true. I just believe that it is. That is what we might call, if we were to give it a label, confused Belief. It is belief that can't go much further, that can't really give an explanation, but it is belief nonetheless. Now, others of you tonight, based on your knowledge of me, and again, giving me benefit of the doubt, sincerely believed my words, believed that it was true, and yet you were still surprised when I said the statement was true before I explained it. We might call this non-expectant belief. It is belief that doesn't translate into an expectation of action. It simply stops after belief and expects nothing more to come of it. And some of you tonight may have sincerely believed what I said, but if we took it to a vote, you would be afraid to admit it out loud for fear of maybe looking foolish. And we will call this captive belief. This is belief that we refuse to proclaim out loud, held captive by fear of what others might say. Now, in each of these categories, realize there is a sincere element of belief that is present. But it is belief that comes with restrictions, with caveats, with fine print. So, in other words, what we see and what we're going to see in John this this evening is that belief is a complicated matter. 
And that belief nearly always comes, if we're honest, with a little bit of baggage attached to it. But John reminds us that despite all of that, it is still belief, and it is a starting place for something more. Let's turn over to John chapter 7 this evening. In John 7, the Jews are getting ready to have this festival called the Feast of Booths. And everyone is going to be there, and the disciples think it's going to be a great place for Jesus to sort of go public with his true identity, to get some good PR for Jesus' ministry. But Jesus knows the Jewish leaders are looking for him, that they will expect him to be there, and so he holds off at first. But then he ends up going to the festival in secret. And he waits until the festival is halfway over before he goes and begins teaching right there in the middle of the temple, right there in the court, sort of the, the main stage, right in the middle of everything. And John doesn't tell us exactly what it is that Jesus is teaching, but in typical fashion, in true Jesus style, it is causing a stir with those who are listening. People are gathering around, and they're arguing with other, and they're even arguing with Jesus. And the things that Jesus is saying are getting more and more profound, more and more radical in their eyes. And so some in the crowd even try to grab him and stop him from teaching, but no one is able to get to him. And it's here at this point that John puts together two statements that almost seem to contradict each other. In verse 31, he says, Still, many in the crowd believed in him, and they said, When the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? Now to us, sitting here this morning, this may seem a little bit bizarre. This crowd is believing in Jesus and awaiting the Messiah at the same time. And yet we know that Jesus is the Messiah. So what exactly might be going on here? And I think what has happened is John has given us a portrait of confused belief. The kind of belief that still doesn't quite get all the details, doesn't quite get how this is all going to work out, but it's willing to try. It's willing to start somewhere and give it a shot. And I think we might be a bit confused, too, back in this time. This is a chaotic time. This is a chaotic place. Jesus is still new on the scene. No one is quite sure what to make of him, including his own disciples. And yet he's teaching these radical things that seem to be reframing Jewish teachings in a new light, and yet they have this, this ring of authority to them, like Jesus really knows what he's talking about. And when we look at it through that lens, it's actually quite amazing that in the sea of confusion, the seeds of belief are still beginning to take root in the hearts of many who are listening to Jesus. They are confused, they are unsure, they are not really ready. If you corner them and ask them to explain who is this Jesus really, they might say, I'm not sure. Is he the Messiah? I'm not sure, but I believe in him. I believe that he is somebody special and they still believe nonetheless. And I think what John is showing us is that there is a place in the kingdom for those of us with confused belief. Because confused belief is still a starting place for something more. It is a belief that can take us somewhere greater, somewhere deeper. And that's why John records it for us. Several chapters later, we go to John chapter 12. And in John 12, Jesus finds himself in the midst of yet another feast, this time for the Passover in Jerusalem. And just like in our first story, people are having all kinds of differing reactions to his teachings. There are some who, despite everything they have seen and heard in Jesus' ministry, despite all of that, they still choose not to believe that Jesus is the Christ. And yet John reveals to us in verses 42 and 43 that at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. 
For they loved human praise more than praise from God. Can we sincerely believe in Jesus and yet be afraid to share that belief out loud? Can our selfish pride exist for a time alongside this incomplete faith in God? John says, yes, it can. And here is what it looks like. And before we object to this, we might stop and realize that this may describe a lot of us in this room at least at some point in our life. Sincerely believing Christians who are still finding ourselves allured by the things of the world. Because that is what John is describing here. He is describing captive belief. In the hearts and minds of these Jewish leaders, without a doubt, as John lays it out, there is a seed of belief that is beginning to take root, but it is not yet strong enough to break through the walls of pride and flattery that they love. It is held captive by things that they desire greater than that. And in all of us here today, there is sincere belief. And yet all of us could name something, could point to something that is sometimes stronger than that belief, that holds it captive that is not strong enough to overpower our own human nature, and so we continue to reach for worldly things with one hand while we cling to belief in the other. And that's what the main struggle for the vast majority of those of us who are Christians is. It is not outright rejection of God. It is wanting to hold on to God while we reach for something else. To not walk away from God, but to want God along with this. If I can just hold both of these, reaching for something in addition to God, thinking that then we'll have it all. I'll just have both. Because we are all vulnerable to the trappings of whatever it might be that we desire in that moment even more than we may desire our faith in God. So here we are in John 12. And the Jewish leaders have one foot in the world, enjoying the praise of men. And they also have one foot ever so lightly planted in faith, where belief is beginning to take root. And John says this is captive belief. Despite its baggage, it's still belief, and it is a starting place for something more. Just like confused belief. It's a small start, but it's a place to go somewhere greater, somewhere deeper. Faith has to start somewhere. And so it does with these Jewish leaders. So far in his gospel, John has shown us belief in the midst of confusion, belief that is caught up in the trappings of the things of this world. And yet he has reminded us that these are still stories of belief nonetheless. But I think John gives us his most beautiful story of belief one chapter earlier in John 11 with the story of Lazarus. In John 11, Jesus is starting to hit his stride in his ministry. He's traveling around, he's teaching, he's healing, people are putting their faith in him. And in the midst of all of this, Jesus gets the news that his friend Lazarus is sick. Now Lazarus has two sisters, Mary and Martha, and they are pleading for Jesus to come quickly and to heal their brother. And yet Jesus holds off for two days before going to see Lazarus in Bethany. And so by the time he arrives, Lazarus is dead. In fact, he has been in the tomb for four days. And when Jesus finally arrives, Martha runs out to meet him. And can you imagine her frustration, her, her anger, her sadness and grief that are just overwhelming her? But listen to the exchange that she has with Jesus. Because John is giving us a stunning example of faith in the midst of heartache 
and grief. John 11, 21 through 27. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And I imagine tears streaming down Martha's face as she looks at Jesus and she says, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. For those of us who have gone through the painful journey of losing someone we love, and because of that are holding on to our faith so precariously, Martha is here for us. Martha is here teaching us and showing us what it looks like to believe in the midst of heartache and grief and loss. And so Martha makes this bold statement of faith in verse 27, but then just 12 verses later, we find her standing outside the tomb of her brother, standing next to the man that she sincerely believes to be the Messiah, the Son of God, who was to come, and yet when he calls for the stone to be rolled away, she tries to stop him, to keep him and to keep herself from having to see the body of her brother again to keep from having to be reminded yet again of his death. She says in chapter 11, verse 39, But Lord, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been in there four days. And she almost throws that four days in there to remind Jesus, You waited. You waited. So it's been four days. Martha is showing us non-expectant belief. It's a belief that allows her to sincerely trust Jesus' words. But it's one that won't take her past that point. It's a belief that won't take her to expect the action that Jesus is about to take to raise Lazarus from the dead. Even as Jesus tells her, I am the resurrection and the life, she doesn't know what to do with that. And it can't take her beyond the reality of what's right in front of her, the death of her brother. And so putting her sincere belief in Jesus' statement of, I am the resurrection and the life, she is unable to carry that over into hopeful expectation of what that means for her right then at that moment. And yet besides, despite all of that, Martha still believes, John says, Martha still believes nonetheless. And John reminds us that there is a place in the kingdom for those of us with non-expectant belief, and it is still good, and it is a starting place for something more. I hope these stories from John tonight have brought you comfort, because you have been reminded that belief that comes with baggage, and all belief comes with baggage, is still good because belief has to start somewhere. Whether it's belief that isn't still quite sure what to make of this person named Jesus or whether it's belief that still stumbles over the things of this world or belief that struggles to expect God to act in a mighty way, I think each of these individuals in John would tell you, my belief had to start somewhere too. Our own belief has to start somewhere. And so whatever imperfections might currently be in your level of belief tonight, know that you are in good company. But I hope, in addition to comfort, you have also found a charge to mature past that level of belief. 
Because belief with baggage is a starting place, but it's a starting place for something more. And the something more part is key because if John's gospel teaches us anything, it's that our belief in Jesus should always be growing and maturing and taking over more and more parts of our life. That we should not be content to let those imperfections remain in our belief. That in the words of Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, we should strive for unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. So let us mature to those deeper levels of faith. But again, that belief has to start somewhere. And whether your level of belief tonight comes without a lot of understanding, whether it comes sometimes without much expectation, whether it's belief that is still caught up in some of the things of this world, know tonight that it is still belief. It's a starting place for something more. It's a starting place to grow, to mature, to become a more dedicated disciple and follower of Jesus. And so tonight, the invitation is here for all of us to mature, to go somewhere deeper. Maybe it's a deeper Bible study. Maybe it's prayers on your behalf. Maybe it's, maybe it's responding to the call of Jesus and having your sins washed away in baptism and starting, starting that walk with him. But whatever it is, whatever it might be tonight, you are always invited to come as we stand and as we sing.